Hello, my name is Derek from Tomcat Gas Training and welcome to this series of videos all about different flute types. Now, I've been asked numerous times on the videos to uh, actually make this video. So, I'm going to make three videos about the three different types of appliances and their flute systems. Now, ironically, we're going to be starting with type A appliances, which are flueless ones, such as a cooker. Now, before we get into this video, please could you take some time to subscribe because it helps. And again, don't forget to hit that notification bell because you want YouTube to tell you when we're uploading videos. You know, Mondays and Wednesdays. So, uh, let's stop waffling and uh, let's get on with this video and find out exactly what these flueless appliances have got to offer. Come on then, let's get on with it. All appliances are now classified by PDCR 1749-2005. This is a new European standard for the method of evacuation of the products of combustion. It means that the classification of appliances burning combustible gases is the same across the European community. There are three main types of appliances grouped according to how they discharge their products of combustion. Now this European standard now classifies these appliances as type A and B and C. So type A is flueless appliances, type B is open fluid appliance and type C are room sealed. So let's look at type A first. So these types of appliances is not intended for connection to the flue or any device for evacuating the products of combustion to the outside of the room in which the appliance is installed. The products of combustion are released into the room in which the appliance is installed. The air for combustion is taken from the room. So these appliances would be a cooker, a flueless space heater, and you can actually have a flueless water heater. First flueless appliance I want to look at is flueless space heaters. So let's find out everything we need to know about the flueless space heater. Now this is the flueless space heater we're going to be flue gas analysing. Now you don't just want to be racking up to a flueless space heater and flue gas analysing it and jogging on. That is not what we've got to do. First of all, the regulations state that we can't service, repair, commission, install a, a gas appliance unless we have the manufacturer's instructions. Now with flueless space heaters the manufacturer's instructions are really really important because they're not all the same. Okay, so having the manufacturer's instructions is number one important. Now, number two, we must do a visual inspection before we flue gas analysing this appliance. Okay, now things we've got to be looking out for is, first of all, the size of the room. Okay, is this room big enough for this appliance to go into there? Now, according to the manufacturer's instructions, it says this cannot be installed in a room less than 30 metres cubed. But there is a formula to help us with this, and we'll have a look at that in a minute. Now, next consideration is, it requires ventilation, permanent ventilation. And this permanent ventilation has to be 100 centimetres squared of free air up to 2.7 kilowatts, if it's installed in a room. And it should be installed in a living room, okay? Now, it can't be installed in a shower room, it can't be in installed in a, in a bathroom, it definitely can't be installed in a bedroom. So, sighting considerations always needs to be taken into account. So, this vent, 100 centimetres squared, has to be at least a metre away from the appliance. And that is to stop the uh, pilot, the, the ASD, um, staying on. Okay? So that's why it's important it has to be a metre away. Even though the manufacturing instructions in this book says it only needs to be 500 away but now it needs to be a, at least a metre away. Okay, now this vent also can't be behind radiators, it definitely can't be behind furniture or curtains, but you've got to take into consideration whether the cold air is gonna cause problems. So always sight them high up, okay? And obviously they've gotta go on an outside wall. So other considerations are, this cannot be installed in a room without a primary source of heat. 
So what do we mean by a primary source of heat? Well basically radiators. Okay, so it can't be a standalone heater. There has to be another way of heating the room so you're not running it all the time. Okay? Also, all flueless appliances require an openable window. So it's got to have an openable window. Now, a flueless space heater fails its flue gas analyzer readings, it's ID. The ventilation requirements for this, if they're wrong, at risk. But if then, if it fails its, its uh, flue gas analyzer readings, it becomes ID. So these are the considerations we've got to be looking at before we even attempt to flue gas analyze this appliance. Now let's have a look at this fire in a little bit more detail. Now I've removed the outer casing. So basically what we've got here is a glass front. The reason for the glass front is to actually send the products of combustion through the catalytic converter. So this is a catalytic converter here and it's also to reflect the heat out. So that's what the glass does on the fire. So again, the seals, according to the manufacturer, we must check the seals are intact when we come to service it. Remember, gas appliance needs to be serviced every 12 months. Now, catalytic converter, what does that do? Well, basically what it does is it converts the CO from the gas back into CO2 and water vapor by scrubbing it and adding oxygen, basically. So pretty much like a car does, car catalytic converter. So that's basically what it's doing. Now, you know, loads of stories about catalytic converters. They don't last very long. Now they've done ongoing research, most of the manufacturers for these catalytic converters, and they will say they will last between 27 and 30 years. Okay, but that's if it's running uh, no less than 16,957 hours in its life. So about 17,000 hours in its lifetime. And they've worked that on four hours a day, seven days a week for five months a year. So that's what they've been looking at. But obviously manufacturer's instructions will tell you how long these catalytic converters will last. Now you can see I've stripped it down. So I've taken the outer cover off and the glass. So like I've just been saying, this is the important thing. Now if I flick it over, you can see there is a seal down the sides, across the top, but there isn't across the bottom. Because like I was saying, the air for combustion has to come in through the bottom, up through here, and the catalytic converter is here, just under here. So when this glass goes back where it should do, it allows the air to come through the front here to keep the glass clear but the air comes in through the bottom here comes through here and then is scrubbed by the catalytic converter now a couple of things i just want to clear up on the installation first one is when you install the fire or the flueless space heater in the position of a, an old open flued fire you can't have the old fire opening open at the back because what that will do is that will be kind of the same as the vent being too close to the fire. It will keep the ASD on. So that has to be completely sealed. And that includes vents what are put into chimney openings to stop condensation. That's the first one. Now, the other thing is these fires, flueless space heaters, cannot be installed in bathrooms or shower rooms because of the damp atmosphere. And then, this is the one I don't get. Some manufacturers say you cannot install them in bedrooms. Other manufacturers say you can install them in bedrooms as long as you've got a CO alarm or a carbon monoxide alarm. I don't think I would be installing one in a bedroom. Because that's where you go to sleep, so what if you go to sleep and leave it on? Mind you, anyway. Yeah. Read the manufacturer's instructions on the installation of a flueless space heater in a bedroom. I personally would never fit one in there and I would always advise a customer think of something else. Why would you need a fire in your bedroom when it's cold, not warm? Anyway, that's a few things on the installation. So let's have a look at the ventilation requirements for these flueless space heaters. 
So we've got appliance type, maximum rated input in net, room volume, vent size, and whether we need an openable window or not. Same as what you would do for a cooker. Because remember, it's a flueless appliance. So we've got a space heated in a room. So that's a living room, dining room. And we've got our maximum rated input in net kilowatts of 45 watts per meters cubed. I'll go through that after this. It says room volume, meters cubed, with a dash in it, because we're looking at the 45 watts per meters cubed. And then it says the vent size, we need 100 centimeters squared plus 55 centimeters squared for every kilowatt over 2.7 kilowatts net. And an openable window. I'll go through all this 45 watts in a minute. So space heater in an internal space of 90 watts per meters cubed. Again, the room volume is the 90 watts per meters cubed. We'll have a look at that in a minute. And it then says 100 centimeters squared plus 27.5 centimeters squared for every kilowatt over 5.4 kilowatts net with an openable window. So we'll look at that. And then we've got a space heater conforming to BS EN 499-2002. What the hell is that? Well, it's an LPG fire. Okay, and that's one stored in a room. We've then got up to 50 watts per meters cubed, but the room volume has to be greater than 50 meters cubed. And then it's 25 centimeters squared per kilowatt with a minimum of 50 centimeters squared at high and low level with an openable window. And again, space heaters to BS EN 499-2002 is again LPG. And again, it's to an internal space. This time it's 100 watts per meters cubed with a room volume has to be greater than 50 meters cubed. And again, it's a 25 centimeters squared per kilowatt with a minimum of 50 centimeters squared at high and low level. And an openable window. So that's what we need to be working to for the ventilation. Now, before we move on to how do we do this bit here, the 45 watts per meters cubed, the ventilation is incredibly important. Now, if you're a gas engineer, first of all, manufacturers say the best way of doing this is 50-50 split. So if you need 100 centimeters squared, get two vents, 50 centimeters squared each and put them high level and low level. Okay, now then, for customers, you do not block these vents, okay? Even when you're not using the fire. Never ever block a permanent vent for an open flued or a flueless gas appliance. You might not wake up, okay? So please, if you're a customer, never block an air vent up. Even when you're not using the fire. As an installer, if you think about where you're putting these vents, so it's not blowing cold air across the customer, then they technically won't be bothered at uh, blocking the vents. What the manufacturers do say about the ventilation for these flueless space heaters is one, it can aid convection and distributing the heat around the property. So if you're using a flueless space heater in a living room, leave the living room door open because it will then go around the property. Now let's look at how we're gonna flue gas analyze this appliance. Now, according to the manufacturer's instructions, there are two tests we need to carry out. Um, it's written down here in black and white. It says the first test we need to do is the COCO2 ratio test. And then the second test we're gonna do is the room CO2 test. So we're just going to concentrate on testing the appliance first. Now, it also says we don't use this. So BS7967 says we don't use this sample probe for flueless. We use this sample probe. So this is the L-shaped five hole sample probe. Uh, probe. Now I've got the analyzer running 
it's actually reading an oxygen level of 20.9. I don't know whether you can see that. Uh, CO of zero, CO2, nothing, ratio, nothing. Okay, now I'm lucky here, I've got a metal fire surround. So I'm just gonna stick it to my metal fire. No, I'm gonna be able to see it there. I'll stick it here. Hopefully, we'll be able to see that. Okay, so now what the manufacturer says using the five hole sample probe, it says to sample across the top of the outlet but not touching okay now it also says to run the fire for 15 minutes beforehand and no more than 30 minutes okay so this has been running for about 15 minutes now so what it says is to sample across the top here And it says not to touch, just to keep sweeping backwards and forwards until we get a stable reading or we get our lowest O2 reading. Okay, so our lowest oxygen reading or our highest CO reading. Now, we shouldn't get much CO coming out of this because it's supposed to be converting that CO into CO2. It also says we can't have a ratio of more than 0 0.001. Okay, so that's a ratio of less than 0 0.001. Remember guys, it fails this test. It will automatically make it ID. So at the moment we've got an O2 of 18.3, a CO of 0, a CO2 1.8, and a ratio of 0.0000. Now we've been flue gas analysing this for quite a while now, and our ratio is not going off zero. But our CO2 levels keep going up and down. And our lowest oxygen reading so far I've had is about 18.6. So that's our lowest oxygen reading. So it's getting off, it's getting quite hot here now. It's getting pretty damn hot. So the oxygen levels are going back up. Our CO2 readings are all over the place to keep, they've gone down again now. And I'm just literally doing what the manufacturer tells me to do. So I think we can pretty much say this is our final reading. So our final reading, got an O2, it's gone down to 17.9, 17.8. We've got a CO of zero, we've got a CO2, 1.9, and again with no ratio. pretty much say this has passed. Now according to the manufacturers for this fire they talk about the next test, the next uh, CO test really, which is a room test. So basically what the manufacturers say is follow the procedure in the British standards for doing a room test but hip height. So it says use the standard probe Hold it at hip height in the centre of the room where the fire is installed and monitor the CO readings for uh, 30 minutes and take the readings every minute. But if you were doing a, uh, a room, proper room test, you wouldn't be in the room. But this is what the manufacturer says for the fire. Okay, and again, it says your CO levels should not exceed 9 ppm, 9 parts per million while you're doing the test and if it does then you should stop the test at any time so if the room becomes vitiated more than nine parts per million co then you should stop the test now before we move on to the next appliance which is going to be a cooker i just want to cover a few things now first of all if you measure the room in cubic feet if you wanted to turn it into cubic meters then you divide it by 35.3 
and that'll turn cubic feet into cubic meters. If you want to do it the other way, just times it by 35.3. Now then, working out the room size for this flueless space heater. Now, in the manufacturer's instructions, it said it cannot be installed in a room smaller than uh, 30 meters cubed. Now then, hmm, it, and that's a 2.2 kilowatt fire. But if you haven't got manufacturer's instructions, it says follow 45 watts per meters cubed for a room or 90 watts per meters cubed for an internal space to work out the ventilation requirements. So it says it can't be installed in a room less than 30 meters cubed and it needs 100 centimeters squared. But if you didn't have that information, there is a way of working out the ventilation requirements by using the size of the room as well. So first of all, can the appliance go into that room? So if we did the 45 watts per meters cubed and we said the room was 60 meters cubed, so we'd do 45 times 60, would come out at 2,700, and that's watts. And if we wanted to turn 2,700 watts into kilowatts, we divide by 1,000, so it would give us 2.7 kilowatts. So the maximum, or the minimum size room, we could put a 2.7 kilowatt fire, would be 60 meters cubed. Okay. There is another way of working out whether it can go into that room by doing the 2.7 times 22.22 is 59.994 meters cubed or 60 meters cubed. So they're the two ways without the manufacturer's instructions of finding out whether or not the appliance can go into the room. Now, action levels. Very, very important when you're doing room safety. We're going to look at uh, room checks at the end. Now, CO room action levels. If you get greater than 30 parts per million of CO, you need to evacuate the room in any test you're doing. Except cookers. We're going to look at cookers next. Okay. Now it does say if it's uh, more, if it's not to 100 CO in the room, it's safe for an engineer to go in for 30 minutes while you're testing. So if you've got a report of fumes and you're getting more than 100 parts per million, or well, up to 100 parts per million, they say it's safe for 30 minutes for an engineer to test. Don't think I'd want to do that, but there you go. And it says if it's over 100 parts per million of CO, you've got to stop your test, evacuate, ventilate. So this magic thick figure of 30 parts per million is for every appliance except cookers. Next ones I want to look at are cookers. So cooker again is a flueless appliance. So let's have a closer look at cookers. And let's just talk about the locations where you can and where you can't install a hob or a cooker. Now the first thing is you can't install a cooker or a hob in a bathroom or a shower room. They're flueless appliances. Also, if it's a bed sit, the bed sit has to be greater than 20 meters cubed, the volume of the room. Okay, you can have a single uh, ring or hot plate, but we'll talk about ventilation um, for cookers later on in this video. Um, next thing is combustible material. How far away from combustible material? So if we look at the hob first, we kind of need a, well we need 50 mil at the back here if it's going to combustible material and also from the side of the actual hob we also need 50 mil coming up okay now if we've got cupboards on the side the cupboards need to be 50 mil away from the edge of here and as long as they're 460 mil up that's okay and then we've got 760 from the top of here to the bottom of any combustible cupboard. If you've got an extractor above your hob, then you need to consult the manufacturer's instructions for the actual hob itself. So, 50 mil, 50 mil, 460 for cupboards this side, and 760 directly above. That's for the hob. Let's have a look at a freestanding cooker. Now, if we look at this freestanding high level grill cooker, the measurements are a bit different. So from 
units to the side here, we need at least 20 mil. Then from units at the side, we need 150 mil. And then anything above the grill, we need 610. So that's 20 from the side, 150 away from cupboards, and 610 cupboards need to be above it, or combustible material. So that's a pretty much a standard, but obviously you would check the manufacturer's instructions to see what the manufacturer actually tells you the cooker or the hob requires. So that's your installation away from combustible material. Let's have a quick look at the ventilation requirements for cookers. So first of all, we've got appliance type. So if it's a domestic oven, hot plate, grill, or any combination thereof. So it doesn't matter what you've got. Also, it doesn't matter what the maximum rated input is. You will still have to go off this section here, which is all about the room volume and the size of the permanent ventilation required. So if we have a room volume of less than five meters cubed, we'll need a hundred centimeters squared of free air plus an openable window or any other way of extraction. Now this opening window has to go direct to outside. If you've got a conservatory built onto the back of your house then that can cause a few problems and it gets quite technical. So basically if you are having a conservatory built on the back of your house it's covering your kitchen window make sure they leave the window open so it can go to outside so this opening window has to communicate direct to outside air uh, if we have a room volume between 5 meters cubed and 10 meters cubed we need 50 centimeters squared we've got this little asterisk we'll have a look at that in a minute and we also need an openable window and if our room is greater than 10 meters cubed we don't need any permanent ventilation but we still need the openable window now, if we've got a, a room volume of between 5 and 10 metres cubed, if the room has a door opening direct to outside, the no permanent vent is required, but the opening window still is, or any kind of extraction which complies to the building regs. Now, if you have a bedsit, your bedsit has to be over 20 metres cubed before you can have a cooker in it. Other than that, you can have a single ring or hot plate. You can't have a cooker if your bedsit is less than 20 metres cubed. Okay, so that's the ventilation requirements for these cookers. If you don't have these ventilation requirements, then you can't have a cooker installed. Well, a gas one, you'd have to have an electric one. So uh, that's really important and what all the gas engineers should be looking for when they're coming to service or commission or install any kind of cooker. Range cookers are slightly different and you should always refer to the manufacturer's instructions for range cookers um, and follow those for your ventilation requirements. So that's vents. As I've just said, next appliance we're going to look at is this, a cooker. Now, flue gas analysing a cooker is different than a boiler or a flue, the space heater in a couple of ways. First of all, flue gas analyzing the hops. Can't do it, okay? So basically what it says is, check the flame picture, okay? So where's the flame picture go? Try the flame picture on high and does it stay lit on low? Well, that's basically what it says to do, just check the for flame pictures but when it comes to the room test we need to use two biggest rings I'll explain that later so the first thing we're going to do is the grill now according to the British standards manufacturers instructions we're using this seven hole probe okay so first of all we need to change it from this one to this one and basically what it says to do is rest it on the top there okay so we're going to get the grill on okay we're going to get the analyzer on 
we're gonna leave this, we're gonna we're gonna run it. But I'm gonna start analyzing it as soon as I turn it on so we can have a look at a few readings. So first of all, let's get the analyzer turned on in fresh air. As you can hear, the analyzer is now on. So first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn the high-level grill on, if I can remember which one it is. Uh, there it is, grill, and I'm gonna put it on maximum. And it's lit, okay? Now, it does say when you're doing this test to have the grill pan in, and the grill pan has to be at its highest level. Okay, well, this one can only go at one level, so we've got it, we've still got it. So that's got to be in position. That's the first thing. Now, I'm going to put that through on the, on the, where the flue is, on the top is. So this is where the products of combustion are exiting the grill. And I'm going to start analysing. So I just instantly turned it on now. And you can see the readings are getting O2, 19.3. We're getting a CO46, we're getting a CO2 of 1, and we're getting a ratio of 0.0047. The reason why the ratio is red because it thinks it's a boiler. So that's the readings we got instantly as we turned it on, and it's a CO we're interested in. Remember, this can't go over 90 parts per million, and it has to get below that 30. This cooker is making more than 30 parts per million. But I've only just turned it on and we shouldn't really be analysing when we first turn it on. We should be at least waiting five minutes. Now, this can actually make 90 parts per million first, but it must start going below 30. I'll show you the the British standards in a minute what actually it should be reading but now it's great it's starting it's gone down below 30 already okay it's now we've got an O2 of 19.4 we've got a CO of 26 we've got a ratio of 0 0.0026 because we've got a CO of 1 okay but that's just me just turning it straight on I should have done. Okay, I should have run it for five minutes first. When we do the CO room test, that will become more apparent um, about the 30 and 90. Okay, so I'm just leaving this to stabilise now. Now, according to my little chart here, if we've got a flueless cooker, which this cooker is, and we've got an oven, which we have, our ratio has to be lower than 0 0.008. Now, the whole bit just says like we've done, I'll, I'll check the flame picture. Now, if we've got a cooker grill, which we've got here, and it says it's CE kite marked, or it's got a, a gas council number, a GC number, then it's 0 0.010. So if the cooker has no CE kite mark or has no uh, GC number, then it's 0 0.020. So that's what we're looking for for a ratio. Now this does not have a GC number and does not have a CE kite mark or a British standard or anything like that. So we're looking for a ratio of 0 0.020 less than. And at the moment we've got 0 0.0016. So we're well in with both of those readings, whether it's got a CE kite mark or it hasn't. Okay, so I've been analysing this for more than 15 minutes and I've now got O2 of 17.9, the CO of 26, the CO2 of 1.7 and the ratio of 0.0015 and that is after 15 minutes now been analyzing it quite a long time now it's getting pretty hot study here okay now again before we do these checks it says windows and doors have to be um, closed 
but the ventilation, if there's permanent ventilation, needs to be uh, unobstructed. So that's basically what it's saying for the cooker. I've been doing this now way over the 15 minutes and my CO reading is, fl is fluctuating between um, 28 and 30 and my ratio is way down to 0 0.0015 so my ratio is in there and my CO levels are kind of on the borderline okay so that is analyzing the grill okay let's have a look at the oven so we're going to do the oven so first thing we need to do is turn the oven on main oven going to put it on to maximum light it now the oven should light in flow in low rate on this one uh, because it's a uh, liquid vapor and then it should go on to high rate now so I'm just going to wait for that and again we're supposed to be letting this run for at least five minutes first this time I'm going to be using the five um, hole sample probe and this is where the products of combustion will come out of this cooker so you need to understand and know from the manufacturer's instructions where these products would come out now this has just gone up to high fire I can help feel the heat coming out of there and I'm just going to place the probe in the flue way. The probe's now in the in the flue way and I can now monitor the readings what we've got. So you can see we have an O2 of 18.3, a CO of 4, a CO2 of 1.6 and a ratio of 0 0.003. And that's literally we've just turned it on. Okay. Now again, according to my little chart for a oven, so we need 0.008 as a ratio. So again, this is literally just turned on. So according to these readings, it is still well under. Okay. So we'll just leave it for the 15 minutes and let's check back. Let's see what it gets up to as a maximum. And now we've got an O2 of 17.4, we've got a CO of 7, we've got a CO2 of 2, and we've got a ratio of 0.003. And that has been going on now for about 20 minutes. Now, all done. That's the readings now. The oven's now turned off from the thermostat. So we were well in with our readings with the oven. The next thing I want to look at is actually doing the room safety check with this oven. But first of all, let's have a look and see what the British Standard says about it. Now let's see what British Standard 7967 2015 says about the room test for a cooker. Now I've highlighted the actual procedure but at the top where it says cookers says ensure that all permanent ventilation to the space in which the appliance is situated is unobstructed so like we said before you need to check the ventilation then the next bit place a saucepan on each of the pan supports above the two largest hot plate burners but approximately one liter of water in each then cover with a lid use a saucepan with a flat base and the base diameter between 160 mil and 220 mil Place the grill pan on its highest position under the grill, which we did before when we did the grill pan. Then it's going to operate the customer's adjustable ventilation in accordance with the cooker instructions, e.g. window or extractor fans. So it says open and operate if there is any. Now, it says light the grill oven and two hot plate burners at their maximum setting. Turn the oven down to gas mark 5 or mid-range if it's not calibrated in the gas mark numbers. Record the CO levels at 1 minute intervals. Now you will be doing this at least a metre away from the appliance and 2 metres off the ground. With you not in the room. So said, turn the hot plate burners down to simmer when the water boils. Turn the grill off after 30 minutes. If burning... Uh, oh, if during the test the CO reading begins to fall without exceeding 30 parts per million, stop the test. 
the installation and cookers are satisfactory. Does not exceed 30 parts per million for longer than 20 minutes and begins to fall and does not exceed 90 minutes, uh, 90 parts per million at any time, stop the test. The installation and the cookers are satisfactory. If it exceeds 90 parts per million at any time, stop the test, ventilate the room, identify the cause and rectify and repeat the test. And then it says, no, do not allow the saucepans to boil dry. This method is also intended for built-in gas cooking appliances. And then note three, where not all burners can be operated together due to the appliance design or for mixed fuel appliances, use only those burners that are applicable. So that is the room test for a cooker. Now the final appliance we're going to be looking at is the flueless water heater. Not that I've seen many flueless water heaters knocking around, but we're going to look at them anyway. So first of all, let's have a look at the requirements for a flueless water heater. Now the first requirement is, this flueless water heater cannot be over 11 kilowatts net. So that's the maximum rated heat input, 11 kilowatts net. Not that I've seen many over 11 kilowatts. I've seen quite a few at 9 and 10 kilowatts, but not many over 11. Saying that's a bloody long time since I've seen one. Anyway, just remember, first one can't be over 11 kilowatts net heat input. It'll also require ventilation, and it'll depend on the size of the room, whether we can have this actual flueless water heater in it. So if our room volume is less than five meters cubed, you can't have a flueless water heater in that room. If it's between five and 10 meters cubed, then we'll need a hundred centimeters squared plus an openable window. And if it's between 10 and 20, we'll need 50 centimeters squared plus an openable window. And if the room is greater than 20 meters cubed, then we don't require ventilation, just an openable window. This appliance also requires a five minute running label. So it'll have a label warning people that the maximum running time of this appliance cannot be longer than five minutes. So that's basically the requirements for this. There's also some stuff you'll see in the manufacturer's instructions which will say, citing considerations near cookers. Nowhere near a cooker. So just follow the manufacturer's instructions for the different appliances to make sure it's installed in the correct location. Remember, it can't be installed in a shower room or a bathroom because it's a flueless appliance. And when you're flue gas analyzing this flueless water heater, it's pretty much the same as a fluid water heater. The CO-CO2 ratio cannot exceed 0.02. So that's when you're flue gas analysing. So this is what a single point flueless water heater looks like when you've removed the cover. So we're just passing the control knob. You can now see the burner. You can see the vitiation sensing device. And we can see the heat exchanger. And then you can see what they call the deflector on the top. So it doesn't have a flue, it has this device on top which is basically deflecting the heat somewhere away from the wall basically. So that's what a flueless single point water heater looks like. The method of operation of these instantaneous water heaters is quite simple. It's activated by water flowing through the appliance. When the hot tap is turned on, the water starts to flow through the diaphragm valve normally located at the base of the appliance seen here. In this water heater, there is a diaphragm valve and a venturi, which generates a significant pressure difference above and below this rubber diaphragm. With the greater pressure below the diaphragm, the diaphragm is forced upwards and moves a push rod. This push rod is connected to the gas valve, which then opens and lets gas flow to the main burner. When the tap is turned off and the water stops flowing, the pressure above and below the diaphragm equalizes and the diaphragm push rod and gas valve return to their original position under the pressure of a return spring. 
it's as simple as that. There's no electric needed. Because this is a flueless appliance, the appliance is protected by an atmospheric sensing device. So the thermal electric circuit is fitted with a thermal switch located in the front of the combustion chamber seen here. When the oxygen in the atmosphere in the locality of the heater becomes diminished or vitiated and is unable to support safe combustion, the products of combustion pass through an orifice in the front of the panel and increases the temperature. This temperature is detected by a thermal switch. When the switch is activated, it interrupts the thermoelectric circuit and the pilot of the main burner is extinguished. So it has an interrupted thermocouple. So, this is an interrupted thermocouple. Well, this is the thermocouple here, and this is the interrupter here. And this is what's connected to the gas valve here. So, it was Thomas Seebeck who invented the thermocouple, or found out that if you have two dissimilar metals put together and you create heat, it will create a small voltage. So, this thermocouple works between about 12 and 30 millivolts DC. So you heat the end up there, it then sends electric current across here, which then sends it to the gas valve, which then opens a valve. Now, it doesn't open the valve this, it keeps the valve open. So you have to press a button in to push it against the end to make the current, to keep it open. And when this end cools down, it breaks the electric current and you hear the valve close. So that's how a thermocouple works. So when we put the interrupter in there, this is operated by heat. So what happens is when this gets heated up, it breaks the electric current, even though the current is being made here, it breaks it here. So again, it makes the valve shut. Now on the one you've been looking at, it's actually at the front of the water heater, but this can also be placed in the hood of the, the water heater. These can also be in things like floor standing boilers as well, so um, they're not just for water heaters. But that is a interrupted thermocouple. So that's the thermocouple, that's the interrupter, and that's where it's connected to the gas valve. Very, very simple idea and uh, works a treat most of the time. Now that is the end of this first part on flues. It's been a bit of a marathon uh, video, hasn't it? So uh, put in the comments below if you think the videos are too long, or if you think they're too short, or whether you think they're uh, perfect. But if you've liked this video, why don't you give me that thumbs up or leave a constructive comment down below. But remember, be respectful. If you're not subscribed to our channel, then please subscribe because it helps. And don't forget to hit that notification bell because you want YouTube to tell you when we're uploading videos. All I've got left to say is, thanks for listening, thanks for watching, and I'll catch you on the next one guys. Cheers.